This all emanates from that £9 million leaflet that we all got sent during the referendum. And there was one sentence at the back of that leaflet, which a lot of people seem to have forgotten. And it said this, this is your decision. Uh, the government will implement what you decide. Now, since then, particularly on the Remain side of the argument, people have wondered, well, what did the people decide? There's been a lot of questions about, well, did they decide to leave the EU lock, stock and barrel? Did they decide to leave the single market? Well, Theresa May has been Prime Minister for 129 days so far. It seems an awfully lot longer than that sometimes. She was a Remain supporter, sort of. But despite the divisions of that campaign, uh, she actually, I still think, leads quite a united party. And it's interesting that it is still quite united, bearing in mind that around 55 to 60 percent of Conservative MPs were Remain supporters. Now, whether they see her as a reassuring figure who's not going to do anything extreme, I don't know. But she's also got the support of most of the Leave supporters on the Conservative benches who, for whatever reason, see her as someone who will implement uh, Brexit <coughs> means Brexit. Now, I think that's okay as we stand here today, but I suspect over the next two months there are going to be an awful lot of strains on the Conservative benches, particularly over the triggering of Article 50. And I'll come on to that um, in a little, bit, uh, a little bit later. She has done one or two things which I think have unsettled people within the Conservative Party. Uh, Marina pointed out one of them, the fact that she refuses to give a guarantee to the three million EU nationals that currently live in this country. Um, I, personally, I think it's a disgrace that she hasn't done that, because I remember that phrase from Neil Kinnock in the 1980s, you can't play politics with people's lives. Well, this, it doesn't get much more personal than your right to remain uh, in this country. I have no doubt that she will give that uh, assurance. She says, well, she has to have that bargaining chip with her fellow EU leaders, who obviously uh, she do, she's hoping that they're not going to say to all the expat Brits living in Europe that they've got to come back here. Now, um, I think that this Brexit means Brexit mantra is going to tire after a time. But if you put yourself in the position of someone who is entering a negotiation, her argument is, well, I can't, I can't give too many details because it's going to harm my negotiating position, which is an entirely logical position to take. If you think of any negotiations that you've ever been involved in, would you go into those negotiations actually putting your cards straight on the table? You certainly wouldn't do it then, and you probably wouldn't do it two or three months in advance of then. But I, th I detect certainly in the media, I detect among the population that there is a growing concern that they do want a few more details. So I think what will happen before she triggers Article 50 is that there will have to be some sort of broad strategy outline, not giving sort of carte blanche, not giving sort of individual details, but I think she's actually going to say, well, this is the direction that we're going to travel in. Because if she doesn't, we're going to have lots of repeats of what's happened this week when Boris Johnson uh, said to in an interview with a Czech newspaper, Britain will probably almost certainly leave the customs union. Now, I can't see what's so controversial about that, because if you don't leave the customs union, you leave the European Union to negotiate trade deals for you, so nothing changes. What is the point of Liam Fox in those circumstances? Rhetorical question. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, if, if we remain in the customs union, he hasn't got a job. He won't be able to negotiate any individual uh, trade deals. So I don't see why that is controversial. Um, there is a split of opinion within the Conservative Party over the government's attitude to the uh, High Court case, which they lost a couple of weeks ago. Um, my view at that time was that the best thing for the Theresa May to do was to accept the decision, introduce a one-line bill into Parliament, and actually to flush out all of those MPs who think we should not trigger Article 50. Because there aren't actually going to be that many of them. It's quite clear from what John McDonnell and Jeremy Corbyn has said that there's not going to be a great appetite within the Labour Party to block it. The Liberal Democrats have said that they will, but Paddy Ashdown, for example, has already said that he wouldn't seek to block it in the House of Lords. 
So it'll be interesting to see what happens in January when the Supreme Court makes its ruling on whether there has to be a parliamentary debate. I think the government have got to go on the assumption that they will lose that decision. And it's rumoured this week that they're going to introduce a three-line bill into Parliament, which will be virtually unamendable. I don't know how you have a bill that's unamendable, but um, it's difficult to see where the coalition of support within either House of Parliament is to really force through an amendment. You'll have the Scottish Nationalists trying to amend it as much as they possibly can, but they've only got 56 MPs. So the question really is, can she meet this March deadline that she has set herself? If she doesn't, it will be a massive embarrassment, not just for her politically in this country, but also within Europe, because it'll be the first thing that she's actually promised to do that she hasn't been able to deliver on. There will be fulminations within the Conservative Party, within the membership. There'll be fulminations within UKIP, because there are so many people that don't believe that the government will carry out its promise to deliver what the British people said on June the 23rd. Um, you look at the, the main people who were advising her on this, Liam Fox, David Davis, and uh, Boris Johnson. And they have varying views on what form Brexit should take, whether we go for a completely hard Brexit, where you leave the European Union, lock, stock and barrel, every single one of its institutions, the single market, etc. And that is the logical position from the vote on June the 23rd. So I think what will probably happen is that we will leave virtually all these institutions and then afterwards negotiate some sort of associate agreement. Probably the same will happen in the customs union. We'll have an associate membership of it, but we will be free to negotiate our own uh, trade deals. Um, the single market is the biggest problem for the government because they're... The, the Remain side of the argument says, well, we weren't told that leaving the EU would mean leaving the single market. Well, there were video clips of David Cameron and George Osborne, if, if I had the courage to do a PowerPoint presentation, which I'm sure you're grateful I haven't, um, I would show you a video clip of both David Cameron and George Osborne saying, if we vote to leave the EU, it's the single market as well that we're leaving. But there's a video gone out today on social media from, um, is it Open Britain, that the pressure group's called, where they've got Dan Hannan, Matthew Elliott, Nigel Farage, and one that I can't remember, um, all saying, well, of course, we can stay in the single market if we choose to. Now, in the end, the, the, the single market is part of the European Union. It's not some sort of separate entity that some people on the Remain side pretend that it is. 8,000 regulations passed by the European Union apply to the single market. There's a commissioner for the single market. So it's very difficult for the government to argue, well, we'll, we'll actually stay in the single market, mainly because of the free movement of labour. Now, this, is the, this goes to the whole crux of the matter. It was interesting, um, Alan's list of divisions within um, the, the, the country, and I, mean, I don't know whether you meant that sort of one side of these people tended to vote leave, one th you didn't. Oh, that's how I interpreted it anyway. Um, but the, the, the thing, people imagine that virtually everyone who voted leave, at le immigration was a, a major concern for them, and for a lot of people it was. Um, I voted leave. Immigration was not a concern for me at all. I'm perfectly happy with the current levels of immigration. Freedom of movement doesn't particularly concern me. But I think that the way this is going to develop, and it's an opportunity for the government to sort of slightly finesse this, is that Angela Merkel, I think yesterday, for the first time, said that freedom of movement has to be discussed. It has to be on the table for discussion among her <laughs> colleagues. And I think she's doing that for domestic political reasons. Um, and I think you'll find that the French come around to that point of view when they see what's happening with the growth of support for the National Front and Marine Le Pen. You've got similar movements in Belgium, in Denmark, in Holland. And in the end, if those issues aren't addressed by the political leaders in those countries, they will get to a point that we've got to. And we see what's happened in the United States as well. So I think it's a growing realisation that political leaders have failed to come to terms with issues that the political elites in this country really haven't taken seriously for a very long time. They, they mouth platitudes about, well, it's not racist to talk about immigration, but then actually don't really want to talk about it. Um, the point that Marina made about the possibility that coming out of the EU would lose a lot of workers' rights, I, I think, I hope I can reassure you on that, 
Probably not, but I'll try. Um, I mean, uh, David Davis, who I work for and is probably my best friend in politics, and I don't think I'm betraying a confidence here, but he said to me almost, I think, the day after the Brexit vote, before he got this job, he said, why would we actually damage the employment rights of the very people who voted for Brexit? So what I think is going to happen, and, and let's not pretend that every single employment right that we have in this country was delivered by the EU. There were such things as employment rights before the EU. What is going to happen is that they're going to incorporate the whole of these laws into British law. Now, I can't deny there may be one or two things, not just in employment rights, but in other areas that do fall by the wayside over time, where Parliament decides to repeal some things but we will have the ability to do that or even enhance uh, some rights in some circumstances. So I don't think anybody needs to go into this necessarily fearing the consequences of Brexit. Yes, there will be bumpy times over the next few years, but I think most people who voted for Brexit viewed it as an opportunity and not a threat. And um, I mean, we may want to talk about sort of the trading relations and all the rest of it in a moment, but I think that uh, there are huge grounds for optimism. We've seen all of the project fear that was perpetrated by George Osborne and David Cameron so far has not come to reality. We were told there would be an immediate consequence of Brexit. When you look at the economic figures, and most of them are actually uh, hugely better than uh, anybody would have forecasted. Now, Brexit hasn't happened yet, so I can't stand here and say that there won't be some negative consequences from it, that you don't have a smooth path in these uh, areas. But I do think that if we all go into it in a sense of gloom and doom, and I do sense that a lot of people are thinking of it in, in that way, that then we have to be careful what we wish for. Um, but in the end, I can't remember who it was who said this is going to dominate all of our lives over the next 10 or 20 years. It absolutely is. Now, for people like me who sort of have a radio show, it's absolute manna from heaven because it, it basically means I've got another two-year contract uh, <laughs> sort of talking about this and Trump and all the rest of it. But I think wider, uh, more widely than that, I think it is going to be a very, very exciting period. And I think it will actually mean that more people become involved in active politics and that can only be a good thing, whichever side of the argument you're on. Thank you very much.